Uh, so my name is Noel. Uh, I'm a final year PhD student in the NSMS program, uh, which is the Nanoscience and Microsystems program. And GPSA funded me to present this research uh, in Germany at the uh, International Symposium on uh, Applications of Fair Metrics. Uh, so my research is titled The Novel Processing of Electronic Quality of Polyvinylene Fluoride, uh, Dead Films for Fair Electric and Dielectric Applications. Uh, and we'll go through and define all these words, and hopefully at the end of this presentation, this title will make a lot more sense uh, to everybody. Uh, but first, let's talk about uh, Germany. So uh, the conference took place in Darmstadt, uh, which is a small little town uh, southwest of Frankfurt, I believe. Uh, and Darmstadt is a really interesting town uh, because it's like right close to the Rhine, the Rhine River. Uh, so we took a Rhine River cruise. And we got to see a bunch of wineries and castles and stuff, which was really cool. It was paid for by the conference, uh, so that was really nice. Uh, but there's like a lot of culture. This is the city square. There's a lot of culture. There's a uh, one, the Technical University of Darmstadt is located there, and that's where the conference was. Uh, and it's one of the tech centers of, of Germany. Uh, and maybe the most interesting thing I saw besides the science there was this little Russian Orthodox chapel. And the history of this chapel is that. Uh, Tsarina Alexandria, the last Tsarina of Russia, uh, was born in Darmstadt. So whenever she wanted to come visit, and she would take Nicholas II, who was the last Tsar of Russia, uh, he would want to you know, go to a Russian Orthodox church. And so they built this small little Russian Orthodox chapel in Darmstadt, Germany. So it's kind of a cool, a cool thing to see there. Um, so now, now we'll go ahead and get into uh, the actual research. So this is kind of an outline of the talk we'll talk about. Uh, I'll give you guys a background on what fair electricity is, uh, the material we're working with, how it's processed, uh, and then we'll talk about uh, what my research actually has been and what I've contributed to the field. Uh, so what is fair electricity? Uh, fair electricity is a property of certain materials to have a spontaneous electric polarization. So this means that the positive and negative charge are separated and they're permanently separated. Uh, and then that this permanent polarization can be switched with the application of an external electric field. Uh, and so why is that useful? Uh, so you get things like this. So if you guys have ever seen pressure sensors, most pressure sensors uh, are based off of this principle where you can push down a piezoelectric and you get some sort of current that comes out of it or voltage. Um, there's also uh, certain types of temperature sensors. If you change the temperature of a ferroelectric, you also get a current. Uh, and then there's these more exotic applications where you can increase the output of solar cells or things like that by using ferroelectric. Um, and so what I'm studying is a polymer, so it's a plastic ferroelectric. So a polymer is a long chain, chain of repeating units. Uh, and so the repeating unit for this polymer is shown right here. So we have uh, two carbon uh, atoms uh, that are single bonded along a chain. And along every carbon atom, we have either two hydrogens or two fluorines. Uh, so as you guys might remember from chemistry, uh, the fluorine atom is uh, very electronegative. And so it's going to attract electrons to it. And so the carbon center here is going to be positive, and the fluorine uh, center here is going to be negative, which is how we get the charge separation to work out. And so depending on how, how this polymer uh, stacks itself, uh, we can either get a net polarization on the macroscopic scale or not. And so there's three different ways, basically, that the chains will orient themselves. But the first way looks like this, and we call this the all trans confirmation because this is called transmog. Uh, we call this the beta phase. And when these pack together, uh, there's a macroscopic polarization. And so this, this is ferroelectric. Uh, this is the gamma phase. Uh, and it's three trans bonds. And then we have one gauche bond here. Um, and so this phase, also when it packs together, also has a net dipole moment. And it's ferroelectric. Uh, and then lastly, we have this alpha phase. Uh, which is a trans gauche phase, so it's alternating trans gauche bonds. And when these pack together, they pack in such a way that one dipole moment's pointing up and the other dipole moment's pointing down, and so there's no net macroscopic polarization. Um, but if you apply a large enough electric field to it, we can get the delta phase by basically rotating one of these chains all the way around, and then we get two dipoles pointing uh, in the same direction. Uh, and so why do we want these for thin films? So when you have a thin film, you get more uh, 
you get properties that are advantageous for devices. Uh, for example, you get a lower heat capacity, so the heat sensors that I was talking about, the light sensors that I was talking about earlier, are much faster and uh, more sensitive. Uh, also, you can use this for medical imaging. Uh, and for medical imaging, you, if you go to higher frequencies, you can get sharper images. Uh, and so, uh, by going to thin film, you can go to higher resonant frequencies. And then, uh, if you can make thin films, you can easily integrate them into small devices like computer chips or transistors or whatever. So this is the motivation on why we want thin films. Uh, but before we get into how we make thin films, uh, we can talk a little bit about how to make thick films. Uh, and so for this, they usually melt the, the plastic and they, then we stretch it. Uh, and so <clears throat> if you don't stretch it, you get the alpha phase, which is not fair with the chip, which we don't want. Uh, and then if you stretch it, uh, we can get the beta phase, which is fair electric, what we do want. But this route is not going to work with thin films. Uh, by thin films, I mean things under, under a micron. And a micron is like a millionth of a meter or something like that. And so you can't stretch something that small because it's going to rip. Uh, and so, uh, what we really have to do is some sort of solution phase, and we can get this uh, gamma phase if we do it right, which is also very much. Uh So how do we produce thin films? There's two ways, like industrially, that people make thin films. Uh, the first way is sort of these Langmuir techniques, where we take the molecules and put one monolayer of molecule on water, and then we'll lift it up onto a substrate, either uh, vertically or horizontally, which is called the Langmuir-Schaefer method, or horizontally, which is called the langmuir plotter method. Uh, and so each one of these model layers is about, let's say, three nanometers. So a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So if you wanted to get to a millionth of a meter, it would take a very long time. Uh, and so this is not really scalable for industrial applications because uh, it takes too long. And also, uh, for a research perspective for a PhD, it's already really well understood. And so there's no real reason to, to research it for a PhD. So that's why we chose spin coding. Uh, and so spin coding is a, a very understandable method. Like we have a, a round wafer, we put some liquid on it, and then we spin it really fast. And the faster you spin it, the thinner the layer gets, which is basically how spin coding works. Uh, and so this is how Intel and all the other guys uh, spin, or put polymers onto anything. Uh, they just spin code. So it's already ready for industrial applications. Um, but the problem is that when we put PVDF, when we try to spin coat polyvinyl fluoride or PVDF, uh, the films are not uh, of very good quality. And, and this is what I'm talking about. So when we spin coat it in normal conditions, we get all these holes uh, in the film, as you can see. So this is an SCN image. Uh, this, this scale right here is 30 microns. Um, and so all these holes prevent it from being electrically useful because if you try to you know, put a, a top contact on it, it's just going to leak through. All electricity is going to leak through. Um, and so we noticed two things from this. We noticed that, so this is at 0% relative humidity, and this is at higher humidities, and we noticed that there's a, a big difference. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to, we're interested in why our water affects it so much. Um, and this, these holes are in a certain way, uh, so if you study hole formation in films, there's different kinds of hole formation, but these films uh, very much look like they've been phase separated, which means at some point uh, the film is split up into two phases, kind of like how oil and water splits up into two phases when you mix it. Um, and so we hypothesize that it is a, a phase separation process that's controlling this morphology. Um, and so to study a phase separation process, we have to make this setup. Uh, so this is our spin, uh, a spin coder. Uh, we can control how fast this spins. And then we can control the humidity in this chamber uh, by using uh, a homemade humidity controller. Uh, and then uh, we have a laser that bounces off the surface. So if you study how the laser reflects from the surface, you can get an idea of how uh, these separate regions will develop over time. And so that's, that's what we want to, to investigate. Uh, so these are the final charts. So this is the intensity plot where uh, the color indicates intensity. Uh, this x-axis is the time that's been spinning, uh, and this y-axis uh, is something that we call the scanning vector. And the scanning vector is basically um, something that tells you about the size of whatever uh, is causing the light to go off in different directions. And so uh, what you have to know about this is that, very, that smaller numbers mean that there's larger 
objects, and higher numbers mean that they're smaller objects that are scattered. Um, and so, as we can see, uh, when we start to scatter light, the large objects form first, and then get to a certain, high, uh, certain uh, maybe size, and then, and then sort of we get all this scattered and light disappears altogether, right? And so this means that the structures that form start out large and then shrink. Uh, and so that is consistent with the phase separation process. So in phase separation, things start out large and shrink, as opposed to like a growing process where things will start out small and grow. Um, and so and then this shows us the dependence on the scattering as a function of humidity and time. And we see as, as the time as the humidity increases, the time that the light takes to start scattering decreases, uh, which suggests uh, that the water is actually causing the phase separation. So if we take all this evidence together, uh, we come to the conclusion that there's this vapor-induced phase separation. And it's vapor because it's humidity that's influenced, not liquid like water. Uh, and so uh, vapor-induced phase separation is a thermodynamic process. And it's really governed by uh, this equation right here, which is the Gibbs free energy of mixing. But what you really need to know about this equation is that if this term is positive, things will phase separate. If this term is negative, things will mix. Uh, so these are three, the first three terms here are terms that are always negative, no matter what, for any system, always negative. Uh, and so these will always lead to mixing. Uh, this term, these two terms can be positive or negative, but in our particular case, they're negative uh, because we've shown that the, uh, that the polymer and our solvent, whatever we're using, are solvable at this temperature. And then uh, the solvent and the water is also uh, mixable at all temperatures. Uh, and so that leaves us with this last term that controls the phase separation, uh, which is the polymer interaction term uh, with the non-solvent water. And the thing to know about this term is this term can be modulated by temperature. Um, and so basically, uh, and, and so basically we can make this term, if we increase the temperature, if this term becomes positive, we can make it a negative again. And so this is a sort of idea you want to keep in your back of your mind. And so the first thing people ask usually is why don't, okay, fine, this is temperature dependent, why don't we just increase the temperature and for the whole spin coating process and keep it at a high elevated temperature. Uh, and so this has been done, uh, but the problem is uh, when you do that at a high temperature, if you crystallize at a high temperature, you crystallize into the alpha phase, which is not ferroelectric. And so we don't want those for uh, many of our cool applications. Uh, and so, so how do we get by this? So these are phase, phase diagrams or phase schematics. Uh, and so this line right here, uh, where it changes from, where it goes to orange, that's where that equation goes positive. <coughs> and so this green phase is where it's negative, and this blue phase is where it doesn't actually matter if it's negative or positive, because the solution is too viscous to separate. Or it's, it's, it's gonna separate really slowly. Um, and so normally when we spin code it, basically what happens is uh, we start out in this green phase, and then as we, as we get more and more water into the film, we go into this orange phase, the film phase separates, and then as you keep evaporating uh, the water and the solvent, you will end up going into this uh, blue phase, and it, it's solid, then it's solid, and we can't change it, and then we're stuck with holes. Uh, and so the idea is, uh, how can we get to this blue phase uh, and still remain at a low enough temperature to crystallize into a ferroelectric phase? Uh, and so the idea would be to let the film go into this two-phase region, and then by heating it up, we can shift this boundary. So by heating up, uh, we shift the boundary, and then so it goes back into a single phase, and then see if we can evaporate the solvent and non-solvent fast enough to get to this, to this blue phase without going back into this orange phase. And then once we're in this blue phase, uh, we can cool the temperature down, and then let the solvent evaporate slowly and crystallize it at a lower temperature. And so this is what we did. So basically we have the same setup as before, except now we have a halogen bulb uh, where we can actually Heat up the, heat up the sample. Uh, so we have a video, which might make things a little bit clearer. Uh, so this is, so we're spin coating a solution right now. You can see the laser reflecting off the surface. And it's a gold substrate. But as you can see, the laser intensity increases and gets bigger. This, is, this means phase separation is occurring. Uh, and 
so now we're going to hit it with the light. And so we hit it with the hydrogen bulb. You see it's like kind of opaque, which means that it's space separated. You'll see it as the temperature goes up, it'll become clear again, which means that it's remixed. And so now it's remixed. And then we can, uh, in, then we can evaporate the solvent and we get pretty good film. Uh, and so these are the resulting films. Uh, so these are on SI2 aluminum and gold. Uh, we're using this, this method that we developed. And these are how the films look if we just don't, don't do it at all. Um, and so the reason we did on SI2 and AL203 and gold is because we wanted to see if different surfaces affect it, uh, which, which it doesn't. Um, but the cool thing is this UNM CHTM logo is actually being reflected. So the film is optically clear, uh, as opposed to this film where it's okay and you can't see any reflection. Uh, and so then we want to study how, how smooth is the surface actually, and is it good enough for, for applications. So we do this thing called atomic force microscopy, which basically is you're, you're running a very sharp tip across the sample. Uh, the tip is something like eight nanometers, so eight billions of a meter thick. And so we can see a really fine resolution of the surface. Uh, and so this, uh, so this width of the whole image is two microns, or two millions of a meter. So it's two, two microns by two microns. And that scale bar is 400 nanometers. Uh, and we can see that the films are really smooth, actually. Uh, and so this is a measure of roughness uh, that we call our mesh roughness. Um, and it's a way to measure roughness. But basically, you know, films normally have, like films that, PBF films normally have a roughness of hundreds of nanometers. And we can see that all of our films are below, below 20 nanometers. So it's significant. Uh, and then we want to check to make sure it's in the ferroelectric phase. And so one way we do that is by monitoring the molecular vibrations. And so we can do that using infrared light. And, and so if we uh, plot the absorption of infrared light, I plot out here uh, where we just see absorption if we're in the alpha phase. Uh, the blue is ferroelectric and the red is not ferroelectric. And, and we can see uh, that for all, on all substrates, uh, we actually only see absorptions uh, in the ferroelectric phases, which means these films are probably going to be good electrically. Um, and so we want to test it out. And so if we test it out, what we can do is measure the surface charge uh, as a function of electric field. And so this is what I was talking about earlier, how we can actually switch, switch the polarization. And so we can apply a field, we go up, we get this polarization, and then we can come back down, and then once we hit a certain field, we'll go back uh, to the negative polarization. And so this shows very clearly that all our films are ferroelectric which means that now these films can be used uh, for electronic devices. Uh, and also to study more fundamental physics of ferroelectrics. That's what we've started to do now. Uh, when we start to see you know, how, does the, how does this field, uh, or how does the field that we orient the dipoles at affect the, the switching mechanisms. And so this is what we're studying here. And basically we can tell that we can see that, that uh, there might be some cooperative switching, so that once things have switched, to switch it back is easier if they're all switched to the same, in the same direction. Which is kind of interesting from like a more fundamental physics point of view. Uh, and then we can also see uh, that you know, if we keep the first field the same and then have uh, this field be different, uh, we can see that there's just a small change in the field, which gives you an idea of how things are switching. Uh, and so this sort of Taught this slide sort of says that uh, things are starting at one location and spreading out instead of happening the whole film all at once, uh, which is also interesting from a fundamental physics point of view. Um, so, in summary, uh, we verified that vapor induced phase separation was the cause of the poor morphology of our films, uh, and then we developed a robust process uh, to be able to put these films on polar and non polar substrates or you know, aluminum oxide versus gold. Uh, and then uh, we saw from those hysteresis loops, that's actually, those hysteresis loops are one of the best uh, ever reported for, for this film. Uh, and that this process allows for the integration and study of the fundamental uh, physics of the therapy. So that I would just like to acknowledge my advisor, Kevin Malloy, uh, my committee, uh, the QPSA for giving me your money to go to Germany, which is really awesome. And, uh, <laughs> and the CHTM and the UNM staff who's helped me with the process. And then, of course, all my friends and family.